RX Television on RXMuscle.com. This is Ask Dave, better known as Hashtag Ask Dave, brought to you by Species Nutrition and Liquid Sunrays. This is your 30-minute question and answer show with Dave Palumbo. All your questions on diet, training, supplementation, IFBB pros, competitions, whatever it is on your mind. Of course, the Olympia just over two weeks away as we now bring in Dave Palumbo. Dave, Labor Day weekend sale upcoming at SpeciesNutrition.com. Yeah, everyone's always asking me, hey, what's the next big product on sale? And uh, we're, you know, decided for Labor Day, we're going to give people an opportunity to get the species isolized, which, you know, is probably the most in-demand product that people want to get, and they always want it on sale. So we're giving you a huge sale this week, or this weekend, I should say, 35% off cinnamon donut, which I, I got to tell you is one of my favorite, you know, flavors. I'm a big like vanilla and vanilla peanut butter guy, but I just opened the, uh, a jug of it the other day. And if you like cinnamon or cinnamon raisin cookies, which is what I'm like, I, that's my favorite. Um, this is about as good as it gets. <laughs> so, and, you know, and remember there's, there's virtually no carbs in it. There's no lactose in it. And there's, uh, it's the highest yield protein on the market. It's, it's 27 and a half grams of protein per 32 gram serving size. So you can, we got 22 and 44 serving 35% off. And then of course, an old favorite that I think the best, the purest, best flavor. If you can make vanilla taste good, okay, you got a good protein and you got a good flavoring system. So we have uh, vanilla ice cream, 22 and 44 serving, also 35% off. Uh, once again, you can go to our speciesnutrition.com website. Uh, you get free shipping in the continent of the United States if you buy over $100 worth. So that, that and alone, for, especially for protein because it's heavy, you should try to buy at least 100 or more just so you get the free shipping. That, that's worth its weight in gold. Plus, you're getting the 35% off. So I don't want to hear any complaints, guys. Here it is. Labor Day special only, what, through Monday, Sid? Monday night, 11.59 p.m. All Eastern right. Standard Time. <laughs> Let's get right to the questions. We have a lot of questions. As always, again, we thank you for your support on rxmuscle.com and, of course, our social media platforms. The first two questions, however, are from the Dave Palumbo Experience app. The first question, Dave, when running Masteron with Tess, is it suggested to also run another compound like DECA as well? He goes on to say, if 1 plus 1 equals 3 with AAS, does the third edition make it even more potent? Yeah, you know, I always say that. It's like my, my uh, analogy is always like one plus one doesn't equal two with, with anabolics. It's one plus one equals like five. The problem is when you add a third compound, you don't really get that, well, that exponential increase in, uh, in effectiveness. So maybe one plus one plus one might equal six, you know, or six and a half. It doesn't really augment it much. It's the two together for some reason does something. I wish I knew what, what their synergy was and how it works. And maybe someone out there, one of our listeners, uh, who's a biochemist or something like that will, will enlighten me. But it, it definitely, they definitely have that type of effect. But when you start stacking three, four, five compounds together, you don't get that crazy effect. If you did, obviously everyone would be doing it. Uh, so more is not better. Off season, I like to stick to two compounds because you're going to be on longer. So you, you know, I'd rather use less toxic compounds so you don't have to worry about it. Pre-contest, we t I tend to stack three things or even maybe a fourth you know, when we get down to the last four or five weeks, you know, I'll add some stuff in there. But um, by and far, two compounds, is testosterone with an anabolic is usually the way to go. So actually another question, a follow-up to that Masteron question is higher doses of a couple of compounds more advantageous than lower doses of multiple compounds? I always get to ask this question. Dave, um, am I better off using 500 milligrams of testosterone a week or 250 testosterone and 250 EQ? And my, my, my answer always invariably is do 500 of each. You know, th there's a threshold, you know, and, and the threshold seems to be, like I said, for the maximum effectiveness with the least side effects is about 1,000 milligrams of testosterone a week with about three to 600 milligrams of an anabolic with it. That seems to be ideal. You know, if you're an experienced user. If you're not, you know, obviously less is, is fine. Now, for hormone replacement purposes, a lot of guys sometimes say to me, hey, Dave, instead of just 200 milligrams of testosterone a week, can I do 100 testosterone, 100 DECA? Because my joints are hurting me. And I'm like, yeah, that, that's fine. That, that's, that's excellent. Not a big deal. You'll probably get a nice effect from it. Um, so it depends what your goals are. If you're looking to maximize size, then you want to do what I, you know, the 1,000 milligrams of testosterone. If you're looking to just do some kind of hormone replacement dosage or you're a beginner just starting, then, then I, think, I always think two compounds are better than one. Uh, unless, like I said, you're just looking for hormone replacement. 
Let's go to our Instagram questions. Again, if you're not already following us, the handle is official underscore RX muscle over the course of the next two weeks. And then, of course, Olympia weekend, we're going to have all of the you know pictures that we're going to be taking around the Meet the Olympians, the shows around town, and, of course, following our IG story. Let's go to Zorro51044, upright rows for side delts with barbell. With barbell, is this done shoulder width and close to the body or away from the body in an arc? Yeah, if you're trying to hit side delts, you really want to have your hands wider when you're doing the upright rows. And I can't upright row with the shoulder because it's destroyed. I'm waiting for the shoulder replacement on this one. This one works now. But uh, when you're doing like more traps and more maybe front delts, I usually took a, a more narrow grip. It's a really hard exercise on your shoulders. I think I see, you know, I remember back in the day when we used to older them, when we had fresh shoulders in my early 20s. Um, I never went crazy heavy on that, but there were guys that would do like ridiculous amounts of weight like that. I just don't think it's, it does anything. I think you, there's a lot of cheating involved. Um, it, it's, it's a very, very difficult movement if you're isolating the, uh, the parts of your body that you're trying to hit. If you're trying to hit traps, you're trying to hit side delts, you're trying to hit front delts. So if you're going too heavy, you're just, you're just cheating. So don't worry about the weight as much as the technique. It's more of a technique exercise. And when I realized that and I finally got that down, it, I got benefits out of it. Um, I actually like to do it on a cable, you know, like a straight bar with a cable, because I get, you get more continuous tension on the bar. Um, you could try that, but once again, tr do it at the end of your shoulder workouts and do it with weight that you can handle and use good technique with. Pat Node, Pat, your thoughts on Tom Plantz's squatting rep ranges. It's my understanding that he advises fewer warm-up sets with lower reps to save yourself for heavier sets as an advocate of 10 sets of squats per leg session. Do your principles adhere to Plantz's methods? I um, recommend, I have a, a power uh, routine that I have people do. And it's like a, a part of, when, they, when I have people on an off-season program, a lot of times I'll give them what's called a power phase routine, which is like, for le every exercise is more just basic movements. Like for legs, it's like 10 sets of squats and like you leave the gym and that's it. Um, but regularly, when you're doing regular movements, where we're going to do in squats and leg press and or hack squats and extensions and curls, usually four or five sets of squats is enough. It depends how heavy you can squat. If you can squat six plates on each side, six quarters, six 45 pound plates on each side, you got to build up to it. You can't just jump up to that weight in two, two or three sets. So, you know, usually you got to go two, one, you know, one plate, two plate, three plate, four plate, up to, up to six plates. I used to do 135, then I would go to 315, 405, you know, and then five and then, and then six plates. So that's how I worked up to it. Um, I was not a, never a big believer in super high reps. You know, once in a blue moon, we would, we would rep out, you know, if I was having a day where I didn't feel strong and I wanted to do a little bit more repetition. But by and far, you know, I try to save myself, like Tom said, for the last heavy set. So if I'm doing, if I know I'm going to go up to 585 on squats, I'm not going to go all out till I get to 585. And then I'm going to try to do as many as I can, whether it be four or five reps, that's fine. But at least I know if I'm going to failure on that, I'm, I'm done. If I try to go to failure before that on 405, you know, or something like that, or 495, what's going to invariably happen is I'm going to burn myself out. I'm not going to do, be able to do the heavy weights, which means I'm not going to build the, the, the muscle I'm looking to build. So, yeah, you got to pace yourself as you get up to that, you know, heaviest set. Let's go to aesthetics with Hen's question on protein variety importance. Currently eating three chicken meals, one beef meal, one egg meal. Uh, is chicken three times a day not ideal for gaining size? So I guess the uh, importance of variety in protein, and I guess if you wanted to maybe judge, uh, given that all protein is not the same. Uh, yeah, I, I like to change up the protein and fat sources a little bit. Um, I like to, you know, have an egg meal. If anyone follows my routines or is, is, is one of my clients, you'll know on my diet, I usually give an egg meal, I give a chicken meal, fish meal, red meat meal, uh, shake meal. You know, because I like, the, I like the variety. You know, I think variety is always best, you know, to get all the nutrients and, and, and stuff you need. And, and who knows how your body assimilates different protein sources. I think there's always added advantages to having different sources of protein because the different amino acid compositions. But that doesn't mean that if you didn't eat, if you ate chicken six times a day, you wouldn't grow too. So everything I just said can be negated because we don't really know. I mean, if you're giving your body, you know, you know, animal sources of protein, which are you know, full complement, high branch chain amino acid residue protein sources, you're probably gonna grow fine. 
what I feel is that, you know, we just get stagnant in the sense that after a while you just can't eat any more chicken. It's like enough is enough. So it's nice to have a little variety because at least each meal is a little different. Having said that though, I can eat the same set of meals every single day. Like it doesn't bother me to have eggs every day for breakfast, whereas some people can't do that. They, they have to vary it up, you know. Um, as long as I'm not eating the same meal all day long, and I could probably do that if I had to. I'm pretty much a creature of habit, but I try to, like I said, I'd like to mix it up. Same thing with fat sources. You could probably get away with having mac and damon all, all day long if you wanted to, but I like to mix it up with avocados and whole eggs and getting different sources of fats, you know, in, in the diet as well. Um, I think the variation of fatty acid sources is more important than the variation of protein sources as long as you're not using vegan sources of protein, which is probably not going to be ideal for building maximal muscle. Hunter Pauly, interesting one here. Should the vacuum pose be a mandatory in classic physique? No, no, I don't think so. I don't even think it looks good on a lot of people. There's only a couple people that pull off a nice vacuum. Um, if it complements your physique, then you do it. Just because you can do a vacuum doesn't mean you should do a vacuum also, because if you don't look good in the vacuum and it doesn't enhance your physique and it makes you look like you have a weird rib box and everything like that, that's probably not a great shot for you to be hitting. You know, They're not judging the vacuum. If you have one and it enhances things, you do it. I always told Jose Raymond, I felt that Jose, with his physique, because he's short, when he used to pull off those crazy vacuums, you know, it really get, added another dimension to his physique, especially on the front double bicep, his ab thigh, his, his side poses. He just, he was, it, was, it was just a really impressive shot for him. And I know he still hits it to, the, to, to a certain degree. Um, but when he was a little younger and he was hitting it amazingly and he wasn't quite as big because as you get bigger it gets a little harder to hit too. Um, I just thought it added another dimension. But I've seen other guys where I said don't, don't hit that shot. Don't, don't blow down on your abs for the front double bicep. It just doesn't look that good. So you got to judge by what looks good. Speaking of Jose Raymond, live right now at RxMuscle.com and of course the Rx Muscle YouTube channel. Uh, Jose Raymond's pre-Olympia interview as part of our of our RX Muscle Iron Road to the Olympia. Dave, I just wanted to touch on that real quick because for many, it is a side that they have never seen before when it comes to Jose Raymond. It is the untold story of his upbringing, very, very humble beginnings, and a Rudy-like story when it comes to his college football career, and even more unlikely, now it's stardom in bodybuilding. You know, I didn't realize that Jose had such a rough upbringing, you know. Um, I, when I interview people, I like to get to the root of who they are. Because I think that it, it, human interest is, is really what it's all about. Now, we're, as bodybuilding fans, we want to know about the upbringing and how our current bodybuilding you know, heroes became the person they became. Because a lot of times it can inspire us in our own lives. And that's interesting to us. Now, a regular person might not care, but I think Jose's story is so good that even a normal person who has no interest in bodybuilding can get behind that story and feel compelled by it. And that's what I try to do with all, all the people I interview. Not everyone wants to go there. Um, we, we reached out to Phil Heath, Mr. Olympia, seven times for an interview. Um, I, he asked me to send him the questions I wanted to send him. I honestly sent him exactly what I wanted to ask him. And he didn't feel comfortable with those questions. And he didn't obviously want to go to places that maybe, you know, he, he didn't feel they were relevant. I, I felt they were. I, I feel like I'm, I'm going to interview Phil. I want to talk to him about what makes Phil Heath Phil Heath, what makes him special, what makes him the champion he is today, where he came from. Because you've got to see where a person came from to understand how they got to where they are. Otherwise, it just seems like someone waved a magic wand. And that's just not the case. Everyone overcomes adversity. Everyone has stuff in their life that they have to overcome. And it's the true champions have the ability to do that. Jose Raymond. I mean, if you would have given me his case file when he was probably, you know, you know, eight years old, I would have said this guy's never going to make it. You know, he would have been another statistic. But he obviously had a will inside of him and, his, and a heart inside of him that was enabled that enabled him to get past his upbringing and become great. Him and his brother, both him and Tito, were in that situation. Tito was basically his surrogate father for most of his life because of it, because he was older. And uh, what these guys overcame to become the stars they were today is, uh, is, is really honorable. So again, that interview, Jose Raymond, the untold story right now at rxmuscle.com and the Rx Muscle YouTube channel. Let's go to kion.kn. Now he says, what's the best food, food source? I'm guessing he meant carb source. He goes on to say the best food to eat during a high carb day after three low carb days and at the right time. You know, 
I'm usually a, a low glycemic carb guy, you know, because I don't like huge spikes in insulin, you know, because obviously, especially when you're dieting, you know, huge, huge spikes of insulin make it harder to lose weight because insulin's a fat storage hormone, right? But when you're so depleted that you have zero glycogen in your muscles and then you carb up, you, you have a day where you have more carbs, uh, you know, I always usually use white rice or white potatoes because those insulin spikes are not gonna do anything negative because the glycogen stores are so empty that anything you're eating carb-wise, and then I'm assuming it's a controlled portions, are gonna go right into glycogen storage. Remember, glycogen storage gets filled first. The excess, once it's filled up, goes to fat storage. But if you're doing one high carb day, okay, those carbs are all going into muscle storage. You might as well get them in as fast as possible, and that's why I'll use an easily digestible, easily assimilatable carb like white rice and white potatoes. They get, we load those glycogen into the muscles, the next day you're back onto a lower carb day. And so that's a violation of, I guess, what I would say is my rules. Now off season, because you're eating carbs every single day, and a lot of them, I usually try to go for lower glycemic carbs, brown rice, um, sweet potatoes, oatmeal, those kind of uh, carb sources, which are not gonna cause huge, huge spikes in insulin, because in those cases, because we have an excessive amount of carbs, we're more likely to store you know, these carbs as fat, and so we don't want that. Charles 7376, does CBD oil lower test and raise estrogen levels like THC? Um, I, I didn't catch, what was that again, Sid? CBD? Uh, yeah, CBD oil, does it lower test and raise estrogen levels like THC? No, no, no. CBD oil just uh, is cannabinoid oil. It stimulates the cannabinoid receptors in the brain. So you get a good, a feel good feeling, uh, a relaxation feeling, you know, a lot of the foods probably we eat have certain amounts of cannabinoids in them, and that's why they make you feel good. I, I suspect you know chocolate probably has a little bit of that in there, but you know when you can take an isolated cannabinoid oil, you know a lot of people you know feel relaxation. Now I noticed that more people who have anxiety, pain, chronic pain, seem to respond better to cannabinoid oil than people that don't. Like I had a couple a couple of people sent me a couple of these vape pens with the cannabinoid oil in it. I'll, I'll do a couple, I'll do a, a vape on it, I'll suck on that thing and get some of that cannabinoid oil into my body. And I feel a little more relaxed, but not really, but I walk around relaxed and I'm not in chronic pain. But I know people that live in pain. You know, they have arthritis, they have other things going on with their body. And when they use these oils, they seem to tell me that they feel a lot better. Uh, so I have to believe it, it's, you know, same thing with, with people who have, uh, you know, who use uh, like marijuana for, you know, cancer chemotherapy, you know, negating the, that nauseous feeling. You know, it doesn't cure nausea and people that don't have nausea, okay? But, but if you have nausea and you take it, it seems to make you feel better. So uh, my dad, you know, toward the end of his life, you know, before he actually, you know, went into uh, assisted living, you know, he was in a lot of pain from his arthritis. I think a lot of it was anxiety too, you know? And when he would, you know, he would use marijuana medically, he, he felt better. And I think it's just because it took the edge off. So once again, I think a lot of the advantages of, of, uh, of cannabinoid oils are on um, people who actually have issues of agitation and anxiety and pain, and that takes the edge off, and that's why these people feel that they're so miraculous. We have a couple of questions relating to pros and whether or not you ever see them, I guess, uh, back on the big stage. Let's go to Kai Green. Kai Green. Dave, I don't know if you saw this picture. He posted about a couple of hours ago. We posted it then on our Instagram, um, showing off. I, I think he's been training, obviously. Does Kai Green still have a chance to compete in the Olympia? And if he does, how do you think he will do? I'll, I'll splice it up to this year and then maybe next year if he decides to compete again. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think, uh, we're going to put the picture up so you guys see what we're talking about, but I don't, I don't think we're going to see, I mean, he looks great, obviously. You look at the picture, he looks phenomenal. He's certainly not dieting, because you can see his face is pretty, is pretty bloated. But he looks crazy big. You know, I, I don't know what's going on in Kai's brain, to be honest with you. I've put out requests for interviews with him. Um, they kind of fall on deaf ears at this point. I don't know why he wouldn't want to interview at this point. He's not competing. Uh, I'd love to, you know, get into his mind and find out what's going on. Obviously, he's pursuing acting. I know that because I, I sat with him and talked to him about a year ago at a show we were at. And he's into acting and creative projects, but I, I don't know what the reason would be for him being this big if he really didn't have any intention to ever get on stage. I do not think we will ever see him on the Olympia stage again. We're certainly not going to see him this year. Um, I wouldn't count out a possible Arnold Classic run again. That's always a possibility. Maybe even a New York Pro he might show up at. Uh, but 
I have to question why he would be staying this big if he didn't have intentions to compete again. Because once again, there's, there's no benefit. He's in his 40s now. I would think he'd be starting to taper back how big he is, you know, if he had no intentions of competing. Because there'd be, you know, why put your health at risk at this point? I mean, walking around at almost 300 pounds, you know, can't be all that good for you uh, when you're in your 40s because things just break a little more easily. Uh, I could be, I could give you, I could, I give a few testimonials for that. So where he's going to wind up, I don't know. I would never speculate with Kai because he's one of these people that just will change his mind. You know, he'll say one thing today and then tomorrow he's doing a completely different thing. And that's make, what makes Kai Kai and what makes us love him so much. Um, one of these days, I, I actually reached out also, I wanted to get him on to do an Olympia assessment show of the competitors, maybe he'll come on as well. If not, like I said, I'm sure at some point he's going to make some announcement and, and shock the world in some way or another. <laughs> so then the other competitor that's being asked about, this is from Colojero22, any news on Justin Compton? I feel as if he had a great shot to be Mr. Olympia one day, but he's fallen off the map. Is he still in the mix? You know, I, I haven't talked to him personally, so I don't want to speculate too much. But I know the last time we spoke to him, he, had, he was battling with some, some health issues. Uh, I think he cleared those up. But, you know, who knows? He might have said to himself, you know, what the hell am I putting my health at risk here? Uh, I'm making good money, you know, training people and doing all my stuff that I'm doing bodybuilding related. And he's just kind of laying low. Um, it, will he come out of uh, retirement and, you know, and, and get back on stage? Any, it's anyone's guess. I, like I said, I haven't spoken to him recently. Uh, but, you know, he's kind of been off the radar. So I would think that he's not going to be competing anytime soon. But, you know, that could always change next year. You know, these guys, I, I think Justin's a smart kid. And I think he's got a good head on his shoulders. And I think he understands that, you know, it's not worth risking your, your health and winding up like Dallas McCarver if, if, if you have issues. Now, if he didn't have issues, that would be a different story. So, I guess we'd probably be better off getting him on the show and interviewing him and let him tell us what's going on in his life at this point. And uh, I know he's, he's a very compelling uh, athlete because he's still young. People you know, saw the progress he made so quickly. And everyone wants to see what his true potential is. But you know, that has to come from inside his heart, not inside our hearts. You know? But will he be back? It's anyone's guess. Scott Mayo, what advice would you give to someone recovering from a ruptured tricep tendon just now clear for light exercise till two months away from full clearance to train. Uh, I always say follow the doctor's instructions with this. You know, Branch Warren is one of these guys that didn't listen to any doctors. He ripped casts off and he started training. He's an anomaly. When it comes to muscle tears, believe it or not, the worst thing that can happen is you can re-rupture. Believe me, I know because my quad is re-ruptured and, and I was following the doctor's orders. I just I had bad luck with it. Um, you don't want to have to go through that whole experience again. I remember when the doctor said, we're going to have to reoperate on you, your, your, your quad is, is detached again. And he said that to me three times already. So it's a very depressing type of thing to hear. Trust me, baby it, do what the doctor says, even if it takes it a month longer than you think it really needs to. You're better off making sure that tendon is secure, has anchored itself properly, and is healed. You can always, you'll get back to it, you'll get the muscle back, it'll come back fast. But if you, if you, do it, if you start training too much and too heavy before it's time and that thing loosens and re-tears, you're going to have to go through the whole procedure again. It's not worth it. Greg at 25, did you, have, did you ever have issues with heartburn while sleeping during prep? Not sure how to get relief. Antacids only work for a short period. Mm. Any suggestions? It used to happen to me all the time. Uh, and usually it was related to like using too much mustard or, or something like that. Find out what you're using spice-wise. A lot of times that's what's causing the problem. Uh, I think I was eating too many pickles one time. <laughs> it's always something stupid. And as soon as I eliminated it, it went away. But if it doesn't, Bragg's apple cider vinegar, I've talked about it before, a tablespoon and six to eight ounces of water, three to five times a day, and you'll get rid of it. If you have like a specific occurrence of it, or if you know it's gonna happen at night, maybe right before bed do it. I'm telling you, it's a miracle cure. You'll, it'll, it'll take away that acidy you know, uh, feeling in your throat. I know you get this question all the time on this show via email, and we have addressed it in the past, but Joe K wants, I guess, a refresher or a primer. Could you go over your pregnancy protocol and would it help with semen count and motility? Well, that's what it helps with, yeah. I mean, just raising sperm count is not enough. It's the, the thing, the sperm have to swim. If they can't move, then they can't get to the egg and they can't fertilize it. Um, 
Yeah, I, I recommend uh, 2,000 units uh, I use of HCG every other day um, with 75 I use of HMG, that's human menopausal gonadotropin, which is really, that's really the magical you know, product every other day, and 50 milligrams of Clomid every day. Uh, and do that for, you know, until, until your girlfriend or wife, whatever, gets pregnant. No anabolic steroids, no HRT, no bridging, no nothing else. Just that, just that, that's it. Don't put any other variables into the equation that are gonna make things difficult and maybe, you know, screw things up. It works, it, there has yet to be a person that's used it that hasn't worked. There was one person who had some kind of like a, like a testicle problem. It, it had nothing to do, it had nothing to do with the hormones. It was it just his testicles just didn't work right. But other than that, every single person that I've, that I've given it to has gotten their, uh, their significant other pregnant and had no problems whatsoever. So give it a shot. Ojala Nico, was Greg Kovacs really the strongest bodybuilder ever or were his lifts just blown out of proportion? Would also like to know if you have any interesting Greg Kovacs stories. Greg was probably, uh, you know, I don't know who the strongest is. I, I think Akeem Williams has to be one of the strong. Dallas was very strong too, but I think Akeem Williams is probably the purest lifter out there in, in the pro bodybuilding circuit. Stan Effering might have the, the best in, in competition lifts just because he knows technique and everything like that, but I've never seen anyone in my life, okay, walk out with almost 700 pounds on their back, take the bar off the rack, walk back with it, and squat six or seven perfect reps like as if the weight was like 135 pounds. That's what Akeem does. He makes it look light. I did it. I was at 315 pounds. I squatted that kind of weight for one or two reps, and I felt like, like there was a house sitting on my back, and I, I could barely walk with it, and I had to have someone right there with me spotting me, and I, and I, and I, was, ner I was scared out of my mind. Akeem does it like it's a joke. Um, so he might be the purest, strongest guy I've ever seen, but Kovacs had this just power about him that like, he did like, he would do like Smith machine bench press. He would put like every plate in the gym on there. It was like, a, like 800 pounds on there and he would do, and he would rep it with good, good form. He see, but he was a big man. He was 400 and something pounds. He was six foot two. He was just, he had big joints. He was just big hands. He was just a huge human being. He was certainly the most impressive looking guy I've ever seen in person. I'm not talking about aesthetically speaking. I'm talking about just muscle size and leanness. He wasn't a fat 400 pounds. He might have been a little bloated, but he was, he was lean at 400 pounds, and that's huge, you know, and, and if, you have to see him in person. Once again, I was 315 pounds walking around with him at 420, and I looked like a little kid next to him. People weren't even looking at me in the shopping mall. So, I mean, that's, that's how impressive this guy was. Um, he, and you know what, when I was over 300 pounds, I used to break chairs at the beach all the time. I'd take these like aluminum chairs to the beach, we'd sit in the sand, and invariably I'd get up or I'd lean back against it and I'd break it. He broke a jacuzzi tub. Think about that. He went to push his hand to, to push himself out of the tub and his hand went through the tub. That's how big and heavy he was and how strong he was, okay? And that's a true confirmed story from his wife, you know? So uh, he, he was, he was a, a creature to be seen and he was also one of the nicest guys you, and one of the funniest guys. A lot of people don't realize Greg had the greatest sense of humor. When I would go visit him or we'd hang out, I would laugh my ass off the entire time and it was him telling stories. It wasn't even me doing anything. He was just a funny, funny guy. You know, I miss him, wish he was still with us. I'm gonna combine two questions here, one from Excellent187 and one from M. Luigi's. During a cutting phase where one is trying to get shredded, can you have post-workout carbs in your shake like waxy maize or just stick to your whey protein and then your thoughts on highly branched cyclic gestrin. Um, I believe was, was the question, the first one relating to a, a ketogenic diet, they want to, while well, on a ketogenic diet, or is it just No, no, it dieting? didn't involve keto, it just during a cutting phase. Okay. For one's trying to get shredded. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, I don't usually, when I have guys on a contest diet, I don't usually put post-workout shakes in there. I usually just have six feedings a day. That seems to be ideal for a guy. Some of them can be shakes, Usually the shakes that I give people are, are whey isolate with all natural peanut butter or whey isolate with all natural almond butter in there. And those are my shakes. And they don't necessarily have to be post-workout shakes because you, you could have a meal post-workout on my diet plan. I don't care. I don't, once again, the, you have to understand, off-season, the, the goal is to build and maximize muscle gains. So you do everything possible, including post-workout shakes and, and all that crazy stuff. Pre-contest or when you're trying to diet off body fat, that's, the goal is to maximize fat loss. Who cares? You're not going to, 
Don't worry about growing. If you put some size on during the, during the contest prep, that's great. But that's not the goal. The goal is to maximize weight loss. If you're too worried about holding muscle and gaining muscle while you're trying to burn fat, you're going to accomplish nothing. You're never going to get lean. So don't worry about post-workout nutrition. As long as you're eating protein every three to, two to three hours, you're not losing any muscle. That's the key, okay? That's the goal. Burn maximal body fat. So yeah, I don't really worry about post-workout nutrition. I don't worry about, you know, I might, like I said, if you like to do a shake after you train, then do a shake. Uh, but getting those, those, that protein in super crazy fast is not important. Now, uh, in the off-season scenario where you're trying to maximize you know, protein getting into the muscle as quick as possible, as well as re-glycogenating the muscle with a carbohydrate replacement you know, drink, I like you know, the high, uh, excuse me, high molecular weight carb products. Um, they come from different sources. They're all pretty much from corn, like the waxy mazes, the high, amylo, uh, the high uh, molecular weight amylopectins, the, uh, the targos. All, they're called different things. They're all pretty much the same thing. It's how they're flavored and, and, and whether they're micronized or not. My product, Carbolize, happens to be micronized, so it's easily mixable. It doesn't get goopy at the bottom of the cup. And I have it unflavored, and we have a, a really good banana-tasting flavor with no sugar in it. It's just, it's just that high molecular weight carb. The branch chain cyclodextrins, which seems to be the craze now because people always want to know what the, what the latest you know, designer type thing out there is, it works, but it's really, it's their glucose polymers is really what they are. I think those, the, the highly branched cyclic dextrins are better for endurance athletes like cyclists and people who are doing really long extended workouts. You can drink this while you're training. That's why they put them in a lot of these intra workout shakes, which I think are unnecessary, but you know, they're not, they're, there's nothing wrong with using them. Um, because it, it's something that can give carb, provide carbohydrates quickly to the muscle, but it's more sugar-like than it is li uh, like a high, uh, uh, excuse me, a high molecular weight carb would be. The high molecular weight carbs are better because post-workout, okay, after you're done training, because they're going to enter the bloodstream quicker than sugar, okay. They just that's just a property that they have, and they're very large in size, so they tend to pull nutrients with them into the muscle. So it's a really good replacement drink. Whereas the cyclic dextrins are better intra workout. One more question. This one on red meat. Not sure if we've gotten many more many uh, red meat uh, questions in the past from Cirque BB20. Could you get into the concept of too much red meat consumption being bad for your health? I'm currently on a low carb, high fat diet, and red meat has proven to be the most nutritionally dense source in line with my macronutrients. As long as, you're, as long as you're digesting the food well and assimilating it well and you're not getting you know, stomach issues with it, I have no problem with, with beef, okay? Grass-fed beef is probably healthier than, than salmon is because it's got more, it got more uh, omega-3 fats in it if it's grass-fed. However, you know, if, you're having, if you're skimping on your essential fatty acids, because let's face it, you know, some of the, unless you're eating grass-fed beef, there's not that much essential fat in beef. You, you might want to just vary the sources. I wouldn't eat it six times a day, you know, just once again, because getting, I like to vary the source of fat in the diet. Um, and if you're eating red meat at a meal, you really don't want to add more fat to that because it's kind of got, even the leanest red meat has, has you know, a significant amount of uh, dietary fat in there. So if you're eating it two times a day, I don't think that's a problem, you know. Now, when we get closer to a show and people have to lose weight a little faster, sometimes red meat doesn't work as well as fish. So a lot of times we'll take the red meat out to lean people out a little quicker using leaner sources of protein. Um, but, but by and far from a health standpoint, I don't think this, it proves to be any uh, problem. That's going to do for this episode of Ask Dave. Again, brought to you by Species Nutrition and Liquid Sun Rays. Once again, at SpeciesNutrition.com, Labor Day Sale, Cinnamon Donut Isolize and Vanilla Ice Cream Isolize, both 22 and 44 serve, 35% off at speciesnutrition.com. Reminder right now at rxmuscle.com and our YouTube channel, an exclusive interview with Jose Raymond where he talks about stuff that you've never heard before and it's going to give you a new perspective on a champion bodybuilder. Jose Raymond, Road to the Olympia right now at rxmuscle.com. For Tyler Shore and Dave Palumbo, I'm Sadiq Faruqi. We'll see you next time.